This is the BBC. Dear brothers and sisters, all are welcome here at the Confessions podcast, whether saint or sinner. Hello and welcome. It's another Confessions podcast from your dear friends at the BBC, uh, where all the sinful members of the public come and share their tales of deceit, debauchery and deception. Boy, are there loads of them. Uh, seeking forgiveness from you, the parish of Radio 2, uh, we have got Sister Bobby. And are we, are we happy with Madam Jojo? Do yeah, we go, we go with that one. one. Okay, yeah, Madam Jojo is what we got. Uh, okay, take it away, Jo. Okay, this week's confession collection includes Brian's story, Come on, Smell the Noise. We have Clara's tale, Take it to the Credit Limit, Lily's prank, Wrecking Doll, and a classic confession from the crypt featuring a first impression on the in-laws. But first we start with Ben's confession, Lanes and Boats and Pains. Please be seated. And this, uh, this is kind of like, a, it's a bank holiday feel, I think, to this one uh, from Ben. Thank you very much indeed for this. Simon, Joe and Bobby, as the May bank holiday approaches, I feel that by confessing now, my soul might at last be absolved after many years of being racked by guilt. Our family of five had taken the opportunity of the extended weekend to go to Holland and visit a well-known holiday park where we spent a three-night break with another family, doubtless having strop waffles, like as, <laughs> as in yesterday's. Oh, was that band playing there? Oh, they were fantastic, weren't they? I think they're playing Coventry. Oh, I hope so. On the bank holiday Monday, we left with our friends at the appointed hour and drove back towards the ferry port at Calais. Having made good progress, we were in plenty of time to make our scheduled crossing, and given that we were ahead of our friends, who had had to make a comfort break en route, we decided that we would have a brief detour to a wine warehouse in Calais. Despite having limited spare space in our sensible family car, we managed to shoehorn some cases of wine around the children in the back of the car. However, the 20 minutes detour with this wine run, uh, it led to the event for which I now seek your forgiveness. Our ferry crossing was scheduled to be at 3 p.m. French time. But despite arriving with more than the requisite time to make this departure, we were informed that due to it being a busy day, we'd have to take the later crossing at half past four. We contacted our friends who thought we'd be on the same boat, but they actually told us that they were in line for the 3 p.m. ferry on account of being just 10 minutes earlier than us. After mild protestations at our misfortune, which were met, of course, with a Gallic shrug, we duly put our 4.30 departure slip of paper around our review mirror and parked in a line with the other ladies later departees. As it happens, we were right alongside those cars, fortunate enough to be on the 3 p.m. sailing, many of which had had makeovers with a nod to the General Lee, Blues Brothers and A-Team, amongst others. Strange. I would describe the owners of these vehicles as raucous, most of them drinking various alcoholic beverages, sharing stories, laughing and generally enjoying themselves. What was going on? My experience, however, was not proving to be so enjoyable. I was stuck in our car with three fractious children and a grumpy wife. After five minutes, I decided to go for a walk to try and rescue some sanity. And as I walked through a very windy car park, a piece of paper blew across the tarmac. Because I recognised its shape, I instinctively stuck out my foot and stood on it. As discreetly as I could, I bent down and picked up the piece of paper, hopefully looking as if it, I was a good citizen picking up some rubbish. I looked at the piece of paper. It was gold dust, Simon. It had big letters and it said 3 p.m., that's three and PM. <laughs> Below this was a number four. And it took a while for me to understand the significance of this. Looking at the other cars, some of their departure slips had two on it. Some had three, some had four. And our original piece of paper had a five on it. We realised that this number actually designated the number of people travelling in the car, which immediately raised a problem as we were a family of five. My children overheard my wife and I discussing this dilemma and having been brought, to be, brought up to be completely honest and to always act with integrity, my youngest suggested a very practical solution. She offered to hide in the footwell of one of the back seats and having demonstrated that she could be concealed in that position, we decided that we should follow this plan. As 3pm approached, the vehicles for the sailing were called forward and we carefully snuck across into the lane with the other vehicles. As we made our way across the port to the ferry, we noticed that one old and beaten up vehicle had been pulled aside. It appeared that this car of four people did not have a departure slip hanging over their rear view mirror and they were not being allowed onto the ferry. We, on the other hand, drove onto the ferry, removed oh. the paper from our rear view mirror and went up on deck to meet our friends who were somewhat surprised to witness our promotion to the earlier sailing. Did we feel smug? <laughs> on our return to England, I looked on the internet to see whether the car whose place I had taken was part of some car rally. 
My guilt worsened when I saw that the car in question was a participant in what's known as the Scum Run, an annual charitable road rally open to vehicles with a maximum price of 500 quid. Therefore, not only had I taken the place of four people and their vehicle, I had taken the place of four people who had driven to Madrid over the long weekend as part of a charity fundraiser. So I obviously therefore need forgiveness, but not from the border <laughs> agencies as we went through border controls as a five-person family, nor am I seeking forgiveness from the ferry company as there was ample room for our, for our extra child alongside everyone else on the ferry. I do seek forgiveness from the four unfortunate scum runners who were left <laughs> on the quayside in Calais and strongly urge the ferry company to make a donation on my behalf because, let's be honest, it was their fault. <laughs> Well, I'm not quite sure about that, Ben. I don't. How does that work out that it's their fault? And why should they make a donation? Anyway, that's the way Ben sees it. Uh, he got that magic piece of paper. He snuck over slightly earlier. However, there was a price to be paid by the scum runners. Joe, what do you make of that? Ain't no way on earth is this person going to be forgiven. Ben, how could you possibly do that? A, you're not opportunist. You knew full well what you were doing when your foot just shot out to stand on the little bit of paper, which you obviously recognised was a ticket for the 3pm. Um, you also knew what you were doing. Concealing a child to get onto the ferry. I, I wouldn't be surprised when you went to this place in Holland, which lots of us might have been to in the UK as well. Maybe you concealed a child when you were going in there as well. I'm not saying you did, but possibly you might have done that if you're this kind of he person. Like you are. kind of person, yes. Yeah, and when you say, didn't we feel, <laughs> no, didn't we feel smug? Didn't you feel guilty? I think that's what you should be saying. So, no, not forgiven at all. Okay, it's a hard line uh, from Joe. What do you say, Bobby? <laughs> well, Joe was after uh, that one. There you go. Joe is after my heart because the thing I've highlighted here is the word smug. Yeah. Ben, the only thing you felt was smug and a small child under your feet. Uh, encouraging your children to, um, to be so deceitful is not a good example uh, in this case. Also, the passenger safety list. They're really important. So, it seems like quite a trivial thing and you want to kind of jump forward. Also, the reason why you were late as you were going off to get wine. Wine? I forgot about the wine. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. The wine. So uh, self-interest all the way, Ben. So you are not forgiven. The Confessions Podcast. On, on, on every confession that I get, there's a little uh, compliance box. And, and if there are any kind of warnings or anything that have mm. to be read out, there's usually a little bit there. And this one just has an X next to it. Is it symbols only do they do they put or words? Well, I think it's I think that's overstating it. I think there's a PG certificate for this if you're eating. Okay. okay. So not X-rated. Definitely not X-rated because <laughs> they go on the Confessions podcast, but the uh, this is so this is PG, but probably only if you're feeling sensitive or if you're eating or preparing food. Okay. okay. I'm feeling good. No food in front of us, Bobby. Go All for right. it. We're good. <laughs> this comes from Brian. Thank you, Brian. Father Simon and his dedicated disciples, I am a state-registered paramedic and I seek forgiveness for an incident which happened on a fateful day in 2001. I was preparing for my forthcoming night shift and was looking for something to eat to line my stomach when I came across some homemade parsnip soup which went down a treat accompanied by some thick toast with butter. You may well be ahead of me already. <laughs> I started my shift about an hour later and we were busy right away. A couple of hours into the shift, my parsnip soup began to, shall we say, make itself known. My colleague in the ambulance initially found this amusing, but was soon opening the windows and complaining about pretty much everything. <laughs> I have to admit I was struggling and trying to find occasions where I could get relief without offending anyone or causing myself embarrassment was getting increasingly tricky. Am, I, am I being appropriately delicate? We continued to be busy until about midnight when we were instructed to return to the ambulance station to stand by. We were grateful to get the opportunity to have some rest and a much-needed cup of coffee. As I'd upset my colleague most of the night already, I decided to take my coffee outside as it was a nice summer evening. I went to a fire exit at the side entrance of the station, away from the main road. On the other side... Now, this is all this layout is, is important here. On the other side of the fire door, there was a shrub-lined path that led immediately left... <laughs> but then after 10 feet bent right to meet a public footpath. The door itself was screened from the path by several tall shrubs. You'll see in a minute why these details are important. I was enjoying the peace and quiet, but it wasn't long before my parsnip soup was preparing another announcement. However, as I was well away from anyone else, I thought I wouldn't be bothering anyone, so I allowed the announcement to proceed. <laughs> With me? Yes. Yep, totally okay. there. However, no sooner had I 
past wind that I heard a shrill scream coming from the other side of the shrubs. The scream in turn made me jolt, resulting in my hand getting scalded by my coffee. And because of the pain, I let out a small yell, which was received by more screaming from the other side of the shrubs, which was then followed by the sound of scampering. What on earth was going on? A moment later, I heard rustling, followed by more screaming, and then, please for help. Well, I didn't know what to do or what had happened, but I knew that my hand was burning. However, if I came out from behind the shrubs, whoever I'd scared would know it was me who caused the alarm. So thinking on my feet, I went back into the fire door and closed it gently. I then found my colleague and told them that I was nipping to the shop for some chocolate. And running out of the main entrance, I could faintly hear someone yelling for help. As quickly as I could, I made my way to the side of the ambulance station where the noise was coming from, and as I turned the corner, I saw a woman's legs sticking out from the shrubbery, her top half embedded in the thick woody branches. Well, my professionalism obviously kicked in, and I calmly announced that I was a paramedic, and I was there to help. The lady was simpering and said in a Scottish accent, Simon, absolutely Go on. no chance. Go on. No! No, just it's try, not. just a is little bit. Is he good bit. at accents? Oh, really... he is just oh, the best. I am, Simon. I am, on, Simon. I am the best. Should Baftas get, all over the place. Why don't we get producer Phil to say these lines? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, she did that. No, yeah. oh, he's saying no. no. Anyway, in which case, it's going to be done in a London accent. The lady was simpering <laughs> and said in her newly discovered London accent, there's an animal in those shrubs. <laughs> it growled at me. And then I heard a yell. <laughs> she continued wide-eyed. <laughs> I got such a fright, I ran and I fell in here. <laughs> I managed to calm the lady down and even shone my torch into the bushes to reassure her that whatever it was that had frightened her, it was now gone. I assessed her injuries, but bar a few minor scratches, she was unharmed, and I managed to untangle her from the thick branches, much to her relief. She finally began to calm down and thank me repeatedly for my assistance, even as I walked her across the road towards her car. <laughs> I then returned to the ambulance station and never mentioned the incident to my colleague. He seemed perplexed that I seemed to have forgotten my chocolate. The next night, I was on night shift again, and shortly after clocking on the station, the doorbell rang. I went through to answer it, and to my horror, there stood the scared woman from the night before, holding a tin in her outstretched no. arms, which both had several small plasters on them. This is for you, she said, to thank you for helping me last night. Speechless, I opened the tin to find a large homemade chocolate cake with the words, My Hero. No. Emblazoned in icing on the top. I stammered, oh, thank you so much, but you really shouldn't have. And after a couple of minutes uh, of this woman saying how wonderful I was, we said goodbye. I shared the cake with my colleagues on the station and told them it was from a grateful patient, which I suppose was true, but I didn't have a slice, says Brian. In fact, to this day, every time I see a chocolate cake, I'm racked with guilt. So here I am seeking forgiveness from the poor woman who ended up with a ruined cardigan, ripped tights and a dishevelled hairdo, all of which was my fault. However, I don't seek forgiveness from my colleague for my wind because he ended up having two slices of the chocolate cake. So I think he's fine. Needless to say, I also now avoid parsnip soup, parsnip soup particularly before a night shift. Which you can imagine, if you're going to be in an enclosed space, you do have to think very carefully uh, about what you're uh, eating. Uh, Brian's confession... Uh, an intriguing one and often when there's we get quite a few uh, breaking wind confessions very few of them end like that however Brian thank you for your confession Joe goes first wow a gassy kind of confession then yes. um, this is an extraordinary case of cowardice I think in the extreme uh, Brian I mean thank goodness he was a qualified medic for you know sorting out the lady when she'd fallen into that bush what kind of volume are we talking about here that would have scared her that much <laughs> that she leapt into a bush it was must have been <laughs> substantial <laughs> mustn't it she thought it was an animal a lion roaring probably um, so I, I don't think I can possibly forget him even though he did walk her across the road and was something of a gent but you know the cowardice and deceit that went into this really uh, okay so that's a no no uh, a not no forgiven. it's a no from joe what did totally. you get from bobby oh well it's an elephant in the bushes or something like that maybe you see the thing is i have a problem because uh, brian's a paramedic and i just think if you're a paramedic generally you're forgiven for everything because you're a paramedic. You turn up in the hours of people's worst times and you do your best to help. So almost, Brian, I can forgive you just because you're a paramedic. So basically you deserve everything. The parsnip snoop is a mystery to me because I have no problems with parsnip soups. That's funny. Uh, but you did, look, the thing is, there's no real losers. Is that, You know, you, you went outside, which is a good thing to save your colleagues. Unfortunate that someone was walking by. You thought it was quiet. I don't think we really, really, really have to forgive you. I think you took the cake in good grace 
face, which most of us would wish on you anyway. So you're yeah, forgiven. Bobby, my hero. It said my hero well, on that's, the cake. Yeah, but to her, you see, it was. So can I you imagine can the conversation you. though of her, him just going, "Well, actually, yeah, well, you just couldn't, could you? No. Uh, you're forgiven on every single level." The Confessions Podcast. That was Brian's confession, Come On, Smell the Noise, where we learnt a lot of ambulance drivers listen to the confession and have had similar experiences to Brian. Yes, lots of people who are confined in a small space and wondering how they're going to get through the tricky hours. Uh, Brian's confession also prompted this question on the people's verdict. As a paramedic myself, says Nicky Nipswich, I must ask, why was a lady hiding in the bushes of an ambulance station at night? Which is a fair point. Still to come, the confession that caused this reaction from Joe and Bobby. <gasps> oh! <laughs> One more time. Oh! I might keep that, actually. <laughs> what, was a ringtone? Yeah. Or when something bad comes through to your phone? Yeah, no, no, just, well, just, on, just on the show, you know, if, if someone plays a bad note while they're... Well, obviously they wouldn't, but, you know, if a band come in, play a bad note. <gasps> oh! Oh, really? No, <laughs> Disappointed. that's awful. Disappointed. OK, now it's that time when we head over to the parish notice board. Madam Jojo, uh, why don't you have a look at that notice right there? OK, first one. This comes from Richard. Dear Simon and your venerable acolytes, this is not a confession as such, but is in part an admittance of a slightly sneaky practice on my part. I work for a college that teaches international students prior to them going to study at our local university. We teach language, English of course, and various other skills, depending on what the students intend to study at the uni. For my sins, I'm a computing tutor. In the past, we were a smaller college, and I was given the responsibility of looking after the IT. Now, however, we have grown, and that job is taken by a proper IT specialist. But as old habits die hard, I still get asked by my colleagues for help with their computers, which I am more than happy to do when I can. So, and this is the confession bit, if I have to fix something on their computer and they're not watching, I put the Confessions podcast as an RSS feed into oh. their office mailbox. See, exhibit A. And there it is. <laughs> Good, we've got a fantastic photograph. This is dastardly. OK, so on the, on, on the photograph, it's like a, it's like a screenshot. Uh, and it's quite clear from down the left-hand column that, yes, you're quite right, Confessions is part of the subscription. <laughs> Anyway, uh, it continues, I think. I am also responsible for maintaining pages on our learning environment website, and this is the place students go to find lecture notes, homework, assignments, etc. One of the subjects I teach is about programming, and I have to provide information on that web page. So I have added the RSS feed for all of my students to see and hopefully read. See Exhibit B. Yeah, we got that. Yeah, OK. If the students ask about it, I just tell them it's instructional and will help them to understand more about British culture and how honest we are as a nation. But please don't reveal that to my employers as they may not see the relevance to computer programming. You see, I quite, <laughs> I quite like this. And, you know, you, you have to get subscribers any which way you can. So the fact that there's slightly underhand methods... Uh, seem to be entirely acceptable. I think we can encourage this. I yes. don't know whether Bobby's going to have the yeah, same no, kind of I attitude think seems, I think it's inspired, actually. Yeah. I think Ingenious. this is great. Definitely. Definitely. Imagine if this is the way you learn about British culture, though. Imagine this is the main way you understand it about life in Britain is from the Confessions podcast. Well, then you'll know how it really is. Yeah, and also you'll know that there is a, you know, there's a little, little group of people that think there is something right and wrong. You know, there's a way to go. There's a way to act. This is where you'll learn your morals. Yes, yeah. your moral compass. <laughs> anyway. We have a moral compass on this show. That's what it is. Kind Richard, of. thank you very much indeed. Bobby, what have you got? Dear Simon and the team, I am 13 and I go to boarding school in which there is no time to listen to the programme in the week as I am probably asleep in maths. But on the weekend, I do manage to listen to the podcast, which ends in my housemates passing me in the corridor, red in the face, laughing my heart out. Wow. They turn their nose up at the podcast, so I decided to go to their computers and sign them all up secretly. I would love it if you could mention me in one of your podcasts so I could show it to my friends and prove them wrong. And I could listen to it on a Sunday. And that's from Eva. So um, Eva is 13 in boarding school, so I think she, she's doing the same as Richard was and just surreptitiously signing people up. We, we should be able to send her something. What what Eva, we do, we, do we have anything at well, all? I don't know. Have we got anything we can send? Can we still nick stuff from cupboards? Listen, I, li I leave quite a lot of clothes and shoes and stuff on just stuff around my desk and I have been wondering over the past few months where it might be going so don't get any ideas just, just if you, you see anything around my desk do not give it away to what your what size shoes are you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a seven Bobby oh, why? Yeah. too big for me we could... <laughs> I had a bottle of whiskey that disappeared a little while ago oh, I just realised we have the same shoe size seriously? yeah <laughs> I've always been called Bigfoot I haven't <laughs> 
So we could we could swap sh- shoes. Lovely. Let's go look under the desk. What now. a thought. No. You- so basically, if All right with uh, we could send you some of Joe Wiley's cast-offs, that's basically... No, you can't. Can we? Oh, OK. And you've got this from Mrs Purcell, English teacher and confession listener, uh, Simon and the Adorable Holy Collective. The BBC clock and card were received with gratitude. All oh, right, because so, we sent Mrs Purcell stuff. <laughs> As promised, the clock has been put to good use in an environment where only academic excellence is being permitted. It gives the time and indeed every long minute of teaching and every precious minute of exams here and, Simon, please say it again, Lycée International de... Oh, I, I need to run up at this. <clears throat> here at uh, Lycée International de Pontonnier in Strasbourg, uh, in France. I attached two pictures. Uh, should my words not be enough? Encore merci pour les confessions et merci aussi pour le crypt. Uh, you actually it, gave away one of the BBC clocks. Mm. How did yeah, you get and, that? Yeah, and they're photographic evidence of uh, <laughs> some students taking an exam and it's the IGCSE first language English reading passages. They're working very hard and there's the Radio 2 clock. It's a Steve Wright clock <laughs> that's propped up against the blackboard. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Uh, I love it. So, um, thank you very much indeed, Mrs. Purcell. Merci bien. Uh, encore une fois. Oui. Uh, right, thank you. We continue. Bien sûr. Remember, if you want to get in touch with the podcast, if you have a confession of your own, one that made you laugh out loud, or you've just managed to sneakily subscribe your mates to the podcast, possibly, and you want to boast about it, then the email address is confessions at bbc.co.uk. We'd love to hear. Now it's time for the grubby part of the notice board. Time to see what non-compliant confessions uh, have been received this week. So hello to Captain Salty. Doing a bad start. Uh, <laughs> Captain Salty is the first out of our post bag of shame after he told us about his time at a beer festival in Bridlington. Apparently, after staggering out of the pub, old Salty was amused to find himself amongst a group of of lifeguards fundraising in the street. He was amused because his outfit was almost identical to the one that the lifeguards were wearing, and his amusement was increased when someone put £20 in his jacket pocket and said, that's for all the good work. Did Captain Salty do the right thing and pass it on to the lifeguards? No. He staggered off and spent it on fish and chips and beer. <gasps> That's terrible. Wow. See, if we'd broadcast that, we would be in all kinds of trouble. But mm. o- obviously on the podcast, it's all slack. We do not approve, though. It's a lot of chips, a lot of beer as well. For 20 quid. Mm. Yeah, that's true. Bad bad times, Captain Salty. <laughs> the Bad Parent Award this week goes to Jill, who put her five and six-year-old on a theme park log flume on their own because she was too scared to go on it. <laughs> as the ride progressed, it was obvious the kids were terrified. <laughs> prompting one onlooker to say, who in their right mind puts young children on their own on that thing? Jill opened her mouth and agreed before walking away, tutting. Her children eventually found her 30 minutes later hiding from shame. That is not... That it really, really isn't good. You should maybe... But you would, wouldn't you? You would walk away. I mean, you wouldn't put them on when they're like no, five and six years old on a log flume, but you would walk away if you have done that thing. I wouldn't have thought they'd been allowed to, to go on on their own. Maybe they well, were very tall. The maybe. thing is, there are there are high restrictions and it, they wouldn't have let them on, so it would have been, I suppose, fine. The thing is, I'd love to have seen the photograph they take as they're coming down the chute, you know? The worst confession of the week undoubtedly comes from Robert, who managed to dent a parked car thanks to careless driving and rather than admit his mistake to the driver, faked a heart attack to explain away the crash. (laughs) That is not right. However, he didn't pass it on to someone else, did he? He did say it was me, but I wasn't in my best health. Yeah, but he could... Like on the verge of death. <laughs> That's like something out of Faulty Towers. Anyway, just to be clear, none of these are okay. Please send us your confessions. But ask, would you be able to look everyone in the eye afterwards? It's confessions at bbc.co.uk. Okay, that's enough, I think, with the unpleasantness. Uh, we'll go back to confessions now. And this is Clara's tale, Take It to the Credit Limit. The Confessions Podcast. Simon, Joe and Bobby, as an impressionable eight-year-old, I was always quick to recognise opportunitive perks in life, which I partly credit to my dad. He managed an interesting and eclectic store in Bath, retailing in seconds, ranging from carpets and soft furnishings uh, to clothing uh, and jewellery, and I frequently enjoyed accompanying him every Saturday. On one particular Saturday, a particular irate and rude customer entered the store demanding to see the manager, waving a package in the air as she did so. Dad escorted her to his office and a short time later they came out wearing happy smiles and being on first name terms. It's not what you think. 
I later found out she'd come to complain after discovering a pair of tights that she bought were actually three-legged and that Dad, in his wisdom, along with his jesting nature, rewarded the customer with three pairs of tights for the price of one. This was certainly <laughs> the story that was passed on. Anyway, well, this stayed with me, and when I bought a small bar of chocolate a few days later and found that it looked a bit off colour, a light bulb went off in my head. I sensed great opportunity, and so with the help of my mum, I drafted what I thought was the perfect letter of complaint popped it in an envelope along with the offending piece of chocolate and sent it off to the manufacturers. Imagine my delight when two weeks later I received a free tin of chocolates uh, by way of an apology and it was then that I realised I'd hit upon a winning scheme. I decided that rather than wait for a faulty product I could speed up the process and so over the next few weeks and months I made additional small purchases all from different manufacturers and set about soiling them in some way. Do you have to use that word? Well, I'm afraid that's... You should see what we've taken out. <laughs> My experiments included sitting on chocolate, taken out a bit there, uh, putting biscuits <laughs> in the coal bunker, encouraging local vermin to take a nibble and then leave their evidence, uh, and using Dad's hammer to crush cornflakes. Each time, with the aid of a slightly reworked letter, I was handsomely rewarded for my scientifically ingenious planning. <laughs> Full of confidence, I decided to aim for larger perks of my newfound trade, and ones that would benefit the family. After all, I did like to share. I filled in many, many adverts from the papers, and two... Uh, and two... One ad... And one ad in particular sprang to mind. We had a cold linoleum flooring in our hallway, Ooh. and I decided that I would invest my efforts into getting a nice new carpet. So she's taking this to quite some extremes now. Love a bit of linoleum. Do you? It's a bit cold, though, in the winter. You, can't, you need a bit of carpet, don't you, on the line? Very retro, though. Having spotted an ad in the paper with the words carpet and free in it, I set about measuring the hall as I'd observed Dad do before. I wrote the measurements in the boxes provided and chose my favourite colour, which was pink. In addition, I also ticked the box for a fitter. <laughs> then a week or so after Christmas, Dad was at work, Mum was at the hairdressers for a perm, and a neighbour was looking after me. I answered a knock at the door, and lo and behold, it was a man calling to fit the carpet. I invited him in, and our neighbour didn't question the situation, so he set to work. When he was done, he left a bit of paper, but I swept it up along with all the other rubbish and put it in my secret place in my bedroom, so no one knew. <laughs> Mum returned from the hairdressers with her smelly perm, like normal, and assumed Dad's carpet assistant had deliberately crept in while she was at the hairdressers and fitted the nice pink carpet as a post-Christmas surprise for her. Now, there's a couple of events that are about to happen, which... One won't surprise you and the other one will. Dad arrived home and Mum gave him a hug as she thanked him for the carpet. Dad looked a bit baffled and looked at Mum with what looked like concern. So he got up and checked the hall and lo and behold, there was the brand new pink carpet. He hadn't noticed when he'd walked in. <laughs> how, how can you not, not notice, notice a pink yeah. carpet in the hall? Dad looked even more puzzled as there was no evidence as to where it had come from. Of course, the one person he didn't think to ask was eight-year-old me, says Clara. I was in seventh heaven and beginning to think that instead of giving stuff to others, I could give up school and open a shop in our shed at the bottom of the garden. That was until a few weeks later when the reminders started, started arriving in our letterbox. And then there's the phrase, and then Dad was summoned to court. <gasps> oh! <laughs> oh, those reminders. Mm. He went to court and explained to the judge that he sold and fitted carpets as part of his job, so why would he even consider purchasing one from London? Well, you can imagine his surprise when the solicitor showed Dad evidence of his signature on the form, which I had perfected using a piece of his blue carbon paper. <laughs> Dad stuck to his guns, but had to eventually agree to pay for the carpet in instalments. Over a very, very long time. Oops. I did a big bad thing, and I kneel before you now, being able to belatedly see the errors of my ways. Well, there was a time when you could send off for all kinds of things and get it delivered, and this was one of those times. Who knew that you could send off for a carpet? The thing is, Clara, it wasn't free, as I think you realised. Anyway, and a pink carpet in the hall. I don't think that's very practical. Anyway, Joe, what are you thinking? Um, well, as I said, I love a bit of linoleum, so I kind of take issue with that. I had actually pink linoleum in my bathroom until recently, fairly recently. Um, but right, let's go back to it. It was Clara, wasn't it, who was eight years old. Did yes. she, she was led astray by her dad in the first place. 
Was it her dad? Well, sh- she just got the idea because she got some chocolate and it was a little bit uh, off, and so she sent off... Right, OK, yeah, yeah. Um, no, no, I, I think she was obviously led astray in the very beginning and is obviously very ingenious, but actually going through to the extent of copying signatures and getting her dad into this kind of trouble, I think may be not forgiven today. OK. Uh, Bobby, is, I can tell you, is looking pretty stern. Yeah. About well, this. Can, 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 sorry, can I just say one thing? I'm just really, really, really hoping that my kids are not listening and they're not getting really great ideas from this terrible show and this terrible confession that's going on. Yeah, let's send off for stuff and then mum can pay for it. Yeah. Bobby. Uh, well, the thing is, is you've got to admire the initiative, haven't you? Because it's you're eight. You know, I can barely put my wellies on the right feet at eight uh, or get myself dressed. So I think this is absolutely fabulous. Of course, then it went on to deceit with your father's signature and then hiding stuff. So then you were way off scale. So I don't think I can forgive you because at eight you did start to know you were wrong. So admire your initiative. That's but in court. That's, uh, yeah, I know, and that's <laughs> and also the hu- effects are huge. But I don't think you really realise the kind of knock on of that. So, but I'm going to say is you are not forgiven although a little bit of admiration for that see the thing is dad goes to court but clara still obviously didn't say it was me because he was still saying no it's absolutely got nothing to do with me yeah i know but then that's when you're a child and you just cannot bear to say what you've done the thing is cannot fess up he also got a hug off the wife didn't he so it was a bit difficult because he thought well if i've kind of appeased somebody here and he didn't realize that carpet was there in the first place and it was bright pink the confessions podcast This is the place where penitents seek our pardon for their sins. Here's Lily who says, Dear Father Simon Crew, I'm confessing to a sin I committed as a youngster of eight years old when we had recently moved to the Netherlands. I have a cool older cousin called Poppy and she had cool toys which she let me play on, a horse which she let me ride and a charming manner that bowled all the grown-ups and me right over. So you can imagine my delight when I was told that Poppy, her brother Sam and my aunt would be coming over to Holland to stay with us for four nights. Hooray was my instant reaction, shortly followed by Can Poppy please sleep on the pull-out bed in my room? My mum and dad exchanged glances and then my mum said that as Poppy was older now, she was 13, she might not want to sleep Uh, in the same room as me anymore but this didn't deter me the days passed in anticipation and finally the day arrived when we would pick up my cousins from Amsterdam airport all went well and we spent a wonderful day touring Amsterdam my two brothers were happy playing uh, with Sam and I was in heaven playing with Poppy we retired to our house and then came the problem of where everybody would sleep we had two guest bedrooms in our house my aunt was to have one Sam the other and Poppy would stay with me however it turned out that my mother was right and Poppy didn't fancy bedding down next to her little cousin for four whole nights. So it was concluded that for the first night Poppy would sleep with me and then she would switch with Sam and have the guest room all to herself. That night we all went to go to sleep but there was a problem. I owned, and I still have today, a two foot tall, very lifelike doll. I called her Hannah and loved her very much but Poppy was terrified of such dolls so I dutifully put Hannah Uh, I was a little bit resentful, but I put Hannah away uh, from my shelf into a cupboard. It turns out that Poppy's fear of dolls stemmed from watching a movie where lots of very hideous things happened with a very hideous doll who turned out to be possessed by the devil, which is always the same in films. That's the standard thing. There's an ugly doll. Oh, it's going to be possessed by the devil. Anyway, so she'd seen that when she shouldn't. And it turns out that that's what we were fighting. When I asked in the spirit of childhood innocence and curiosity what happened next, she said in the film that the doll moved when no one was looking and attacked children. Well, I scoffed at this. My doll, my precious Hannah, would that attack anyone? I don't think so. Not a chance. I thought she was amazing, uh, but Poppy was unconvinced. The next day came and went in excitement. When Poppy moved her things upstairs to the guest room, I was very glad I could take my doll out of her prison and display her on my shelf again. But looking at Hannah... As I drifted off to sleep, I had an idea. I woke the next morning at about 4am, carefully taking my doll from the shelf. I crept upstairs to the guest bedroom and positioned her outside the door in a way that meant that she would be looking up at anyone that came out of the room. A little bit of smudged lipstick here and there. Pleased with my handiwork, I crept back into bed without waking anyone. When people started to get up, I climbed out of bed and went downstairs for breakfast. Just to make it convincing, I asked my mum, where's Hannah? Have you seen my doll? Where's Hannah? She's she's not in my room. 
I don't know, sweetheart. I'm sure she'll turn up, was my mum's reply. Just at that moment, we heard an ear-piercing, ear-piercing, ground-breaking scream from the top floor, followed by the sound of a door slamming shut. My mother and I looked at each other and then began to sprint upstairs. I was faster and more agile due to being younger, and I reached the top before my mum did, quickly tossed Hannah into my brother's room next door. <laughs> now we had my aunt, my mum and me outside the door. What's wrong, Poppy? asked my aunt. There's a doll, a devil doll outside my room, she replied in a shaking voice. There's no doll here, scoffed my aunt Which prompted Poppy to wrench open the door and scream again There was, she was there, it was Lily's doll Possessed by the devil (laughs) I can't find Hannah in my room, I said to add to the convincing story Maybe she moved on her own (coughs) Maybe it was just a dream, suggested my mum Or a trick of the light, I added The stained glass window can make you see things sometimes Or maybe she really did move (laughs) <laughs> Poppy was shaken but recovered a little bit. However, I did turn her as white as a ghost when I pulled Hannah from underneath the breakfast table, announcing, Oh, look, silly me. Here she is. Silly Hannah talking to the spirits again. I don't think that went down either. So, Father Sam, I need forgiveness not from Poppy, who, as one, it was the best prank I've ever played to this day, and two, Poppy has grown up to be a kind and confident young woman who isn't scared of horror movies at all. However, I do seek forgiveness from my aunt for waking her up and from our neighbours for interrupting their morning stroop waffles. Strop waffles. Strop waffles. Is it? And what are they exactly? Yeah. Well, they're those um, syrup biscuits, aren't they? Biscuits and syrup. Strop waffles sounds between like strop the kind waffles. of thing you have when you're really angry. Angry food. I need a, I need a strop waffle. <laughs> that you throw at people. Yeah. That's very good. In fact, I hadn't even noticed that that word was there right at the end. Okay, strop waffle. Very good. Uh, what do you think, Joan? Um, I think completely forgiven because... We've all been there. You have, like, complete devotion and you really look up to somebody and then they reject you, which is exactly, really, in essence, what happened here. You're saying that happened to you? I was speaking about a friend who this might have happened to. Okay, yeah, sure, yeah, sorry, yeah. (laughs) So to be rejected, obviously, there's, you know, it's hurtful. It's really, really hurtful. So maybe um, she got her comeuppance and her just desserts and it was, I I understand this action. I think it's brilliant. Okay. Uh, Bobby, what have you got there? Well, I'm kind of in agreement. Yeah, rejection and definitely just desserts because you rejected her. She's looking forward to you coming, Poppy, and I think, yeah, I'm I'm understanding why Lily acted that way because she was really upset and you wanted, you know, you wanted to go into another bedroom so there you go that's what happens yeah. you know be when nice. you're mean to an eight-year-old be nice some dolls are scary though don't yeah, you no, think? the thing is is i am scared of it i think i know that film as well and i'm not a doll fan i have to say even now they you know i love a clown can't handle a doll but i do understand lily's pain you were eight years old she was older than you she could have been kinder there you go that's what happens does anyone remember from play school the doll humble yes <laughs> That, yes. Enough said, right? That, there was no scarier doll than Humble than in Humble, school. Yeah. <laughs> Is that where the doll Annabelle came from? Because that was re- that was super scary uh, as well. I, yeah, no, my, my son is terrified and he's 17. The Confessions Podcast. How freaky was that? Uh, that was from Lily. That was her confession. It was called Wrecking Doll. If you missed the confession going out live, then you wouldn't have heard reaction on the people's verdict. So here's another chance to hear one of our favourite responses. Kylie in Kent. Simon and Joe completely forgiven. Poppy should have been nicer. However, I do understand her fear of the dolls. Um, we once stayed in a and b where the lady who ran it made dolls in people's own image. Oh, she fine. would even ask for some of your own hair. Yeah. Seriously, to complete the likeness? This is like a Tales of the Unexpected. It does sound like she might have been a witch. <laughs> it, can you imagine? <laughs> staying in, staying in a BB and then she wants to make a, 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 a doll that looks like you and can I have some of your hair and skin? I bet she had cloven feet. Oh. <laughs> very, very strange. Uh, that's it from this week's batch of confessions. Send in yours, please. Confessions at bbc.co.uk. Uh, if you're thinking... Wow, there's so much extra material in the podcast that I don't get on the radio show. Thank you so much, Joe and Simon. Don't thank us yet because we've got even more bonus material as we dive into the BBC crypt and dig out a confession from years gone by. This week's it has been requested by Mark, who says, Dear Simon, Joe and Bobby, could you please consider repeating a confession for the podcast? My wife has never heard it. She was working. It was years ago, but it was so funny that I had to stop driving. I couldn't see. I was simply crying too much. The confession that we would like can only be described as the fart in the car. That's a pretty good description of it. I don't let my children say that word. Don't you? No. Car. What word do they use? I just, I make them say awful things that they now, like age 26, my daughter's always going, 
I went to school and I said the word bottom burp and everybody laughed at me and I've just been humiliated ever since and I will never get rid of that shame. But that's the word I use all the time. That's funny. Yeah. Okay, well, 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 redo it then. Trump as well. Re- rename it. <laughs> and then, then it does sound awful. The confession we would like can only be described as the bottom burp in the car. There you go. <laughs> we managed to find it, so Mark, here it is just for you. The Confessions Podcast. Uh, now, this one is, uh, is from Mike. Dear Simon and the Assembled Collective. The story goes back to the late 70s when I was 20 years old. And although I've told a few people, it's still one of those moments that makes you put your head under the covers at night and go, oh, no. I've been going out with a girl, let's call her Alison, for about a couple of months when she passed a driving test. So she suggested that instead of going to the usual places on a Friday night, we should borrow her dad's car, pick me up and go to a country pub for a meal and a drink. I readily accepted, and the following Friday there was a knock on the door, and there she was, looking fabulous, and ready to take me out on the town. I ought to say, by the way, at this point, this has a sort of a 12A certificate. Thank you. Sort of. The night itself was a typical November one, cold, dark, and absolutely pouring down, and as Alison wanted to talk to my sister about something she suggested, I wait... As Alison wanted to talk to my sister about something, comma, she suggested I wait in the car for her. So I ran to the car and I jumped in. From my vantage point, I could see that Alison and my sister were chatting away and I settled down to wait. However, no sooner as I'd done this, I realised, to be honest, I desperately needed to break wind. I was on my own, so I did so. Extremely loudly, as it turned out. And with a (laughs) terrible secondary effect. The car filled with the aroma, and I knew that when she returned to the car, she would know what had happened, and that this might put a damper on the evening before it had even begun, the way it tends to. So very surreptitiously, I wound down the passenger window and started to fan and then scoop air out, <laughs> using both my hands from inside the car, waft, waft, into the cold November evening. I can now see Alison finishing up a conversation with my sister and starting to run towards the car. Now in panic mode, I actually started blowing air out of the car, sucking it up and then blowing it out. But somehow I managed to get the window closed a microsecond before she opened the driver's door. Hooray, I thought, the moment is saved just in the nick of time. Until that is, Alison opened her mouth and uttered a sentence that will live with me for the rest of my life. In a very clear, almost conversational tone, she said, Have you said hello to Mum and Dad? <laughs> oh, no! I felt my blood turn to ice, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I felt physically sick as I turned my head to see before me her mother and father who, incidentally I'd never met before, were sitting silently, white as a sheet on the back seat. We drove in silence to a local church meeting where she dropped her parents off for the evening in a breath of fresh air and then she went to the pub. We went to the pub. Alison commented a couple of times during the evening that I seemed quite distant. I told her I didn't feel very well. We were home by ten. Alison and I went on to marry and then divorce, and in the entire time we were together, that story was never, ever mentioned by anyone involved. Both of her parents have now passed on, and I haven't seen her for 15 years, but even writing this has brought back the horror again, and so it is with great relief, as it were. I feel pleased to have finally confessed. Any chance of forgiveness, says Mike, any chance of forgiveness, brother Matt. Uh, absolutely, that's the best laugh I've had for a long time. Comes to us all, mate. Comes to us as perfectly natural, nothing to be ashamed of. However, plaud its min. Plaud, yes, plaud its go to her parents for never mentioning it. Just that is outstanding yeah. work. Because he would have died inside if they'd even <laughs> cleared their throats <laughs> as he was scooping her out of the window. Oh, definitely forgiven. Well done, Mike. Mother Superior. Why are men so disgusting? <laughs> Women don't do that, Pauline, do they? I mean, they just don't. Well, men are. Yeah, I mean, I, the poor parents are probably shocked into submission. And um, I think it was fairly disgusting. I think the fact that you did it in what you thought was your own private space ameliorates it slightly. So, yes, you are forgiven but you are disgusting. Sister Pauline. I may disagree on the women don't do that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, no. Um, but, yeah, of course he's forgiven, poor chap, but yes. There, there, there must have been one where the parents are going, shall we mention it now? Shall we, uh... shall we just... Co- the longer you leave it, the worse it gets. I do wonder whether it was a... a there was no, it wasn't a four-seater car, otherwise the parents might have erupted from the back of the car to escape. So, yes. <laughs> that, well done, then, but yes. The Confessions Podcast.
And that was your confession from the crypt this week, uh, featuring Matt and part-time yeah. Pauline, Pauline McColl. It is a fabulous uh, there, one, isn't it? Uh, making a late appearance. I think a few people might have... Uh, yeah, I think that would have echoed with some people. <laughs> you just never know. And you, you just never... And it is never such a certain. surprise. I didn't see it coming. Uh, we've had a lot of bottom burping on, on confessions this week, actually, when you think about it. <laughs> but did you never use that phrase with your children? Um... I guess we probably did. Yeah. Yes. We, we it's, try, it's the essence of what it is, isn't it? We try and avoid such subjects most of the time, however. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you very much for all the confessions we've received this week. If you have a request for a vintage confession, then do send over the details. Um, you have to send it to confessions at bbc.co.uk. We'll do our best to dig them out from the crypt. If you made it to the end of the last podcast, we asked you to tweet the phrase, licked his underpinnings. Uh, thank you, Michelle. That was a very strange Twitter feed. Thank you, Michelle, Julia and all the others who tweeted precisely that. This week's code phrase is... Oh. Um, there was no scarier doll than Hamble. Describe Hamble again. Terrifying. She was kind of gleaming plastic, very dark hair, very... I don't know whether she had eyelashes or not. She was just not the most cute doll in the world. How would Bobby go on to help me out I here? How would you describe her? If she was made in the image of somebody, it would have been made in, not Ina Sharples, Coronation Street. Who was the lovely woman that always had oh, the headscarf? Oh, it was Ina. Wasn't it Ina Sharples? No, she but, did. She had, but when she took Amy her rollers Turtle. out. No, the other one. The Sandy other Richardson. One, no, the other one. <laughs> cross, crossroads, you're not <laughs> helping. So Coronation Street, a uh, lovely cleaning lady, always had a pinny on. She always had a headscarf on. And when she took her curlers out, she had very tight curly hair. Anyways, it's gone horribly wrong. Yeah, anyway, she okay. is very one. menacing demeanour. That was Hamble, that was. That there was, was no scarier doll than Hamble, that'll do. <laughs> if you have something to get off your chest, send in your own confession to confessions at bbc.co.uk. Don't forget to subscribe to the Confessions podcast. You can hear mine and Joe's early evening show five o'clock weekdays on Radio 2. Uh, so thank you very much, Steve, for listening. Thank you, Joe. Goodbye. Thank you, Simon. And goodbye, Bobby. Bye-bye. You've been Bye-bye. fabulous. The Confessions podcast. Go in peace.